So uh, with that, uh, Radio Free Geneva today is uh, uh, brought to you in light of a series, a, a tweet thread that I think was only posted yesterday. We're Normally, we're a little bit behind the, the times. This uh, thread uh, appeared only yesterday, I believe. So we, we are, are getting to it fairly quickly. But Flame is a uh, Christian rapper. I don't know a lot about Christian rappers, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Uh, but I think it was Samuel Say. It might have been Kofi. I think it was Samuel Say. Um, one of those guys, I know they live north of me. Let's just put it that way. Uh, one of the two of them said that Flame was slash is his favorite rapper. Um, and you'll see from the, uh, from the thread that he was once reformed in the sense of Calvinistic and I think is now Lutheran, if I read things uh, correctly. And uh, K-Dub was the one that uh, brought my attention to this uh, initially. Well, not my attention, he just, I follow him and he responded to something that had been said and that's how, that's how all this happened. So you can blame K-Dub for all this. We, we all blame K-Dub for everything. It doesn't really matter. Anyhow, uh, the reason that I chose this uh, to respond to this thread, it's been a while, and it's a um, it's an excellent. Uh, I thought it was well written, and as soon as I read it, I'm like, okay, this is Lenski's take, primarily on um, on the Romans nine material. This is sort of a general. This is generally how Lutherans express themselves uh, very often on this. Uh, in the modern period anyways. And so this would be valuable, edifying. I'm not trying to flame flame, uh, but I want to respond uh, from a reform perspective because I think there are problems with what was said. But since it was written so well, it makes it actually easier uh, to respond to. So uh, I'm gonna read it and probably have to make a few comments on the way through. And then we will go to the big board and uh, do, our, do our thing. Okay, so here's the thread from, uh, from Flame. I joined a Reformed Baptist Calvinist church and attended a Bible study there. One of my professors led the study. He explained to us that he'd be teaching on election and predestination. I was excited and a bit scared, if I'm honest. We isolated the chapter. Please note that language. We isolated the chapter and dealt with it as if Paul's intention with Romans 9 was to teach the doctrine of predestination and double predestination. I've, I've got issues with the language here, um, but that, that, that's, that's what it is. That was wrong and not Paul's intentions. Romans 9 should be considered in light of the entire book, of course, and in particular with chapters 10 and 11. Um, yes, obviously, uh, but... Nine comes immediately after eight, and that incredible um, material regarding predestination election <laughs> at the end of chapter eight, the golden chain and, and the, uh, the heavenly court uh, situation and all of that is, is there. And there is a transition plainly between eight and nine, and nine, 10, 11 do form the final portion of the theological argumentation of the book of Romans, because starting in, in chapter 12, you have the practical application material. So yeah, Paul is building the case that we are justified by faith and not works. Well, he had already built that case. He had established that case all the way back in chapter four, actually. Um, and so uh, I, would, I would disagree uh, there's certainly consistency, but to try to say that what you have in chapter 9 is actually a defense of justification by faith, I think we will demonstrate is simply not the case. Um, he will conclude with the key issue, and that is whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you are justified by faith. Okay, that that is central. That goes all the way back to chapter 3. Um, for all of sin, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile is what the issue there is. So it, 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 what we're going to see is there's an, a, there's an attempt 
to shift the focus, and we'll demonstrate the focus cannot be shifted exegetically, but to shift the focus from the real issue, which is why is it that not all of Israel are Israel? Why, in light of God's promises, why do you have such uh, rejection by the Jewish people as a whole of Jesus as the Messiah? Chapter 9 establishes the uh, historical reality of God's choice in covenant blessing, his choice with whom to whom the promises are going to come. It is about God's sovereignty. There's no question about it. Um, but uh, it will eventually come back around to proclamation of the gospel, who believes, et cetera, et cetera, in chapter 10 and chapter 11, the warnings against the Gentiles in light of the um, hardening that has taken place uh, amongst Israel, not to boast against them, lest they themselves uh, fall into unbelief. So, uh, Paul is building the case that we are justified by faith and not works. Paul is, has already done that. And now he's addressing objections that come as a result of having already established that. In fact, he really, he, he really transitions into dealing with that in the middle of chapter 5. Uh, that's been going on for quite some time. Nor does salvation come through bloodline, but by faith. Well, it, it definitely does not come by bloodline, and it definitely does come by faith. But that doesn't necessarily mean um, that the result of that is going to be what you, what you want to be there. S speaking the truth, that it's not by bloodline but by faith, isn't addressing what Romans 9 is addressing. And that is God's freedom in election that results in faith. That's where the, that's where the, that's where the issue is. If God's election is what results in the granting of saving faith, that's, that's where people struggle. That's, that's where the real sovereignty of God comes in, uh, not just in making something available, but in actually saving. And that's where the objection is. He draws on a few Old Testament figures to make his point, his point of justification by faith. Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau, and Pharaoh, to name a few. Now what we'll see is that the point that Paul is going to make with these individuals is that it is God's choice, not man's. That's, that's the issue of Romans 9. That's why it's so objectionable, is that that's what he actually says, as we will see. That God chooses not on the basis of works, right, or lineage, right, but by grace. So it's the choice of the individual that results in the faith. And that is done by grace. I wish my professor would have rightly taught us that Romans 9, 13, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated, was not about their eternal state, nor individual salvation, not to mention later the two bros reconciled, but about God's free choice to choose Jacob to be the carrier of the nation of Israel. Well, okay, there is no question. I almost feel heat turning on. Um, there is no question to me uh, that God did choose Jacob, and it was through Jacob that the nation of Israel is to come. That's, that's true. No, no question about it. But is that what it is saying in this text? Is that, is that Paul's application? Or is that we need to, boy, we got to get that stopped because it's, it's getting hot in here. Um, or is Paul's application beyond that? There are many people who would say, no, 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 no. Paul can't go beyond that. Because this is the only application that can be made of that. Um, no, that's, that is not um, what we will see. Through whom the Messiah came, as opposed to Esau, who was the carrier of Edom, a wicked nation. Paul assumes people would contend for some injustice in God. That's not fair, they might say. 
Romans 9, 14 through 15, what, the, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. The context is, why has God left Israel in their hardened state and allowed Gentiles to come by faith? Well, there's an element of that, but that's not derived directly from Paul's argumentation, as we will see. Like God did with Pharaoh, he allowed Israel and Pharaoh to persist in their already existing rebellion. It was an act of judgment and not a random, unconditional decision. Now, that's a very odd phrase, random, unconditional decision. God doesn't do anything random. Uh, God does things purposefully. But God does all sorts of things unconditionally because he's sovereign. And God told Moses he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart before Moses ever came into Egypt. Exodus chapter 4. So um, there seems to be some concern there uh, that we need to, we need to be looking at. Uh, he turned them over to what they genuinely wanted. Well, let's point something out from Paul's anthropology. Uh, if you turn someone over to what they genuinely want, we would all be in, in a world of hurt. God does do that. That is an act of judgment. Um, but that's universal of all mankind. So to do their own thing, God hardens after the person has given themselves over to wickedness is put in quotations. I don't know what that quotation is coming from or where it's coming from or who allegedly said it. Um, but uh, the fact is, since we're all fallen sons and daughters of Adam, uh, we've already been given over to wickedness. That is our nature. And unless God, by his grace, restrains our evil, um, there go all of us. So keep that in mind. I wish my professor would have rightly taught us that Romans 9, 22 through 23. Well, we're going to look at this very closely. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make his power known, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, was not, was not teaching double predestination that God made some for hell. Keeping in mind, hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for people, Matthew 25, 41. I've seen this a number of times. Why is it that saying that hell is created for the devil and his angels means that God didn't have, I mean, it, it almost, it's almost like you're opting for some type of open theistic, um, God didn't expect this to happen, and so now he's sort of making a, making a shift in his plans or something along these lines. Uh, what, do you, what, does that, what is that supposed to mean? I keep hearing anti-Calvinists saying that, and I'm wondering, so you mean God didn't know this was going to happen? God didn't plan for this to happen? God's making alterations? What, what are you trying to say? They, they never really say exactly what it is they're trying to say there. Um, but uh, a more careful read exposes that the text says, has endured with much patience. Well, actually, a more careful read, which we hope to provide to you, will demonstrate that what is being said here about um, making the, the vessels of wrath and vessels of, uh, of mercy is the direct fulfillment of the potter and the pots. That's what's not even mentioned here, just right over, right over top of it, as we will see. Uh, a more careful read exposes the text says, has endured with much patience. God is patient and enduring with those vessels of wrath. Well, yes. When he extends life and gives uh, uh, happiness and even health and the blessings of food and, and everything else uh, to those that, uh, that does, I, I guess I have to ask, does God know that these are vessels of wrath? Does he know that they are going to be uh, experiencing punishment in eternity? I, these are questions we, the thread does not answer. Um, the, that the text does not say God prepared those vessels for wrath. There is the Lenski argument. Uh, we'll look at it very closely in the text here in a moment. 
this requires us to completely disconnect one verse from the verse that came before it. Uh, that's where that's the primary error is right there. Um, it only says, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and power, endured with them? So it's, it's like, oh, this is, a, this is just a conditional. No, this is, this is the whole point. As long as you recognize that verse 6 is the question that's being answered all the way through, the confusion found here will no longer be confusion. We'll see that in a moment. Um, does God want to show his wrath and power? Yes. Who prepared the vessels of wrath? The devil? The sinning person? Perhaps. Yet Paul does not say. Yes, he does. He, he does so very clearly. Um, it's silent as to who prepared those vessels of wrath for destruction, but the whole of Scripture credits the sinner and the devil for sinful rebellion. It does, but under the almighty decree of God. <laughs> so God decrees the ends and the means, uh, so you don't get rid of the one just simply um, for the other. Yes, it does say explicitly and clearly that he, God, has prepared vessels of mercy beforehand for glory, Romans 9, 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. God is actively doing one and is not actively doing the other. Again, sounds like Lenski or someone similar along those lines. Again, the context is salvation by faith, not works. How did we... Okay, if, if the previous stuff wasn't about salvation, how did this become about salvation? This is, again, one of the inconsistencies of those who try to get away from the sovereignty of God in Romans 9 uh, and saying, well, that, that the first illustrations were just about service or they're about nations, but now all of a sudden we are talking salvation. When, how did the switch take place? Because Paul's, Paul's not shifted his focus. Interesting. Um, addressing the question, why hasn't God brought all the Jews in but gives his mercy to the Gentiles, he allows the Jews to stay in their rebellious state. Having said all that, Paul still has hope. Romans 10, 1, Brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. And in chapter 11, Paul confesses that Israel's rejection is not permanent. Romans eleven thirty two, For God has consigned all disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Yes, it's true. There is universal condemnation under the law. And yet Paul notes it ends with universal grace for those who believe by faith. Okay, so... Uh, most people who uh, read uh, Romans chapter 9, a uh, couple things, it's always, always good and appropriate, always proper to read any section in its context. It, I, I think every Christian, uh, after a relatively short period of time in the, in the, in the faith, should have some of the key books outlined in their minds. So I, I, I don't think that I'm at all being outrageous um, to say that we should, we should know what each chapter in Romans is about and the flow of the argument so that we can recognize when an argument is solid or when it's maybe pushing the boundaries just a little bit like some of what we saw there. Uh, we should know where justification by faith is actually established in Romans 3 and 4 um, with the conclusion in 5 and then the transition into uh, application issues. Uh, for example, the whole issue of the second Adam and uh, original sin, everything in Romans chapter 5 after, therefore, Romans 5, 1 is really the end of Paul's argument establishing justification by faith. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's the conclusion of that argument. And now having said that, let's address these other, these other issues that, that then come before us. And so uh, it is always good to know and to not isolate chapter 9 and to know that chapter 9 goes into chapter 10 and uh, chapter 11, and this is the end of the doctrinal portion, and then chapter 12 begins the application portions in, in regards to regular Christian life and, and all those things that go along with all of that. That, that is all good. Uh, it's always good to know the Old Testament background, but it's absolutely necessary to walk through the text. And that's, you know, we've done a few debates on this. 
And um, that's where the opponents just fail. Uh, it's just, that's where they struggle so badly is to simply walk through the text. Um, and so let's, let's do that. We've done it before, but we've not done it, to my recollection, in the big studio. Not, at least not, as, not as far as I, as I recall. So let's, uh, let's utilize uh, the, the, uh, the big board here and uh, look at Romans chapter 9. That didn't look right. I did not. There we go. See, I didn't see my, got to have my blue thing uh, do its blue thing. Um, now, I, I note that uh, Romans uh, 9, uh, 1 through 5, ends with the uh, disputed text. And uh, I did notice that I have the NASB up here right now. Uh, but the Legacy Standard Bible has um, improved on the NASB's rendering, uh, Romans 9, 5. Not part of our topic right now on the deity of Christ. There's a whole chapter. Well, there's a section and a chapter in the Forgotten Trinity on this if you want to take a look at it. But I think it would be better to have who is God over all rather than God blessed forever in the NASB. But that's an issue, not an issue right now. Uh, point being... You have the blessings of Israel that have been mentioned, and then 9-6. And here is what is key. Um, here you have the Word of God. And what Paul is concerned about is, ook, it is not as if the Word of God has fallen, has, has failed, Paul is well aware of the arguments that have been used against his position. Um, he has been debating in synagogues and in marketplaces for, for quite some time. And so he's heard the arguments. He's heard uh, the Jewish responses to his great, beautiful presentation. I'm sure that Romans 8 reflects some preaching on the apostles' part. And so they hear this uh, this wonderful presentation of what God has done in the Messiah, but they reject him as the Messiah. And you just know that one of their primary responses is, well, Paul, if this is true, and all these promises have come true in the Messiah, why is it that the vast majority of our people reject Jesus as the Messiah? This, is, you, this means that the word of God has failed, that the promises to Israel have failed. And so he immediately wants to say, it is not as though the word of God has failed. And then here really is, if you keep this section in mind, you will understand the rest of Romans 9. And it is not a long section, but it is not, there you go, for not all those from Israel, these are Israel. Not all those who are, uh, the translation in ASB here is, for they are not all Israel who are descended. Notice descended is put in italics, so it's, so it's being added. Um, that would come from X Israel. These are Israel. And so that's Paul's response, is that, well, you may say that the majority of the people are rejecting Christ, but that doesn't mean that they're actually of the people of Israel. So who are the people of Israel? Well, verse 7, nor are they all uh, children, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's seed, sperma, but, and then you have the first Old Testament citation, in Isaac, your seed shall be what? Kleithesetai. Shall be called. Shall be identified, but it is also kaleo, calling, election. This is what um, 
Paul is going to be uh, playing out. That is, it is not the techna tes sarkos, the children of the flesh, that are the children, the techna tu theu, but the techna tes epangelias, epangelias, the children of promise. And then here's a term that we should know by now in Romans, Legizitai, literally to impute or to be reckoned, they are the ones reckoned as seed, as um, the children, as descendants, as the NASB uh, puts it uh, over here. So his argument is indisputable from any Old Testament perspective. Anyone who's read the history of Israel, the history of Judah, knows that you have a, uh, a huge number of circumcised, um, uh, animal-offering individuals who do not have hearts of flesh. They have hearts of stone. They rebel against Yahweh. They do not love Yahweh's ways. They go after other gods. It's, it's the you, you can't read any one of the prophets and not encounter this. And so Paul has thought this through, and he said it's obviously just being the physical descendant of Israel does not make you one of the children of Israel, one of the children of God. But it is the children of promise. In other words, God gets to delimit the range of his blessing, the range of his covenant. God is the one making these choices here. There is nothing in any of this here that is talking about mankind's faith. This is all about God so far. Are we agreed on that? I, I think that's pretty pretty plain. All right? Okay. So. Scroller on up. So how does he prove it's the children of promise that are regarded as descendants? Well, that begins in verse 9. So. I wish it didn't do that. I bet you there's a way to turn that off someplace. I just haven't found that particular switch. For this is the word of promise, because he talks about the promise. This is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So God promises this. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born, it had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. So once again, y you have to have your Old Testament um, backgrounds class in mind. And so what we have here is not only that situation, not only that is an example, but Rebecca, when she had conceived twins by one man, Isaac, our Petros, our father. Now, please note verse 11, because part of the argument that, that was given in the thread was that you have a situation here where what Paul is doing is he's bringing these people in. He mentions Rebecca and Abram and, and Sarah, and all this is to demonstrate justification by faith. But what it's actually demonstrating is God's sovereign choice to do as he pleases. That's what it's actually demonstrating. And verse 11 is really hard to get around. For although... Mapo, for although the twins were not yet born and had not done anything, either good or bad, 
in order that he kat eklagain prothesis to theu mene. Here is, this is really an important section right here. In order that, so here's, here's your hina clause in verse 11. So that, in order that, God's purpose according to choice. God's purpose according to choice. Whose choice? Well, it was before the twins had were born or had done anything good or bad. That's just, the whole point was their actions did not determine what God did. And his whole point is, and it wasn't God looking down the corridors of time or this whole, or the whole first beginning of, of verse 11 is a lie. So before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to his choice would stand or meno would, 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 would abide... And then, just to make sure, just to make sure that we're getting this point, because, again, Paul had been through this in the synagogue, in the, on the street corner, in the marketplace, how many times? And let's, let's make sure it's clear here. Uk ex ergon. Not... From works. And we're not just talking about works here of merit or uh, covenantal works or anything like that. That's, that's not what this context would be. This is human action right there. Uk ex ergon. Not from works, but instead ek to kaluntas. Now ex X and X, some people might look at that and might get confused. They're the exact same word. The only reason this is in the form it's in is because it has a vowel following it. This has a consonant following it. They're the exact same word. So not by means of or from ergon, but instead from by means of the one calling. The one calling. Look, ask yourself a question. If you wanted to express the idea that it's not from what humans do, it's from the purpose and calling of God, how else are you going to say it? How much more strongly can you create? Uk Allah, not this, but this. Not this, but this. But we want it to be this, not this. And so we stand on our heads. And we put filters on. And we, we go, well, maybe if I look at it from this way, or maybe if I look at it from that way, and maybe we consider this over. Instead of just letting this be what it says. Not by human actions, but by the one calling, and that's that the one calling takes us right back up to here. All right? His purpose, his choice. That's what it's about. Because of that, it was said to her, the younger, the, the greater will serve the older. The, the younger, sorry. Ha, my zone, the, the greater one or the older one will serve the lesser one. Just as has been written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Now, that, this text was mentioned by Flame in his comment. And that, well, okay, this, this, is, this all goes back to the Old Testament, and this is about um, God establishing Israel, but not Edom. Uh, the choice goes through Jacob, it doesn't go through Esau. All of that is true. All of that is true. No one is disputing that. 
But what is the basis for saying, while that is true, that's all it can ever be? Because that's not how Paul is applying it, is it? Because he has, just as it has been written, and that summarizes all of this. Are you saying Paul's wrong? Are you saying Paul's gone beyond what he should have said here? Oh, Paul, he's just, he's just talking about uh, Israel and Edom here. Well, then why does he put it in here in the flow of this context, in the flow of his argument? Because it's up here, not only this, okay, this is where we are. Here's our example. And what is he establishing? That it's not of human works. It is of the one calling. And that's why the more manly dude, the guy going out and doing the hunting, he's got the four by. And then the accountant kid, the accountant kid gets chosen and the guy in the four by gets, over, gets, gets passed by. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. There was a clear exercise of choice that was not based upon the deceptive Jacob or the manly Esau. It was God's purpose. And that's what loved and hated means in that context. It resulted in choice. And if you're going to say, well, but it's, it's, it can only be about nations. Do you do the same thing? We, we're doing Radio Free Geneva, right? What's one of the clips? That began? You know, sometimes we have to remember, not everyone knows what all those clips were about. But back when I debated Leighton Flowers on this very text, well, I debated on this very text. Leighton Flowers was debating on the topic. But uh, when we debated, one of the questions that I asked him, which we include in here is, are you using the same methods of exegesis that we deal that we use when we're dealing with the deity of Christ, or, or in this case, with messianic prophecy, that you then utilize when you're talking about, in in his case, total depravity and things like that, and he admitted no. And so what I'm saying to you, if you're taking Flame's position, if you push this on Romans nine and say, well, Paul Paul can't apply it in any other way other than the conclusion, the limited inclusion we come to from the Old Testament context. Do the same thing with all Messianic prophets. How about out of Israel I will call my son? I'm sorry, out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, not out of Israel. Out of Egypt I will call my son. You're going to be consistent. You're going to have to have a problem with the apostolic application here. And you have to reject that utilization of that text in Hosea. You're going to have to. you got, you got no choice here. Be careful. Uh, you don't want to. You don't necessarily want to go to go there. Don't save. And let's scroll it on up here. All right. So when you have this uh, statement of God's sovereignty over all things, then immediately the question becomes. What shall we say there? There is no unrighteousness with God. May genoita, may it never be. Not God forbid, but may it never be. Okay, so would you really expect that the argument would be, well, God's being unrighteous because he's simply dealing with nations? No, these, this objection is... Very much what you, well, what I hear online pretty much every day. That's not fair. God's playing favorites. What shall we say there? Is there, is there injustice with God? Well, he goes to the encounter in Exodus 33 between God and Moses. And as we pointed out in the debate a couple weeks ago, um, I will mercy whoever I mercy. Um, and I will, I will compassion whoever 
Hanan, I compassion. So these are verbs in the language. We use nouns. And so it's, you know, I will have mercy. Uh, I will have compassion, but it's actually stronger than that. I will mercy whom I mercy. I will compassion whom I compassion. This is really, let, let, let's be honest here. This is where people struggle. Because we don't trust the judge of all the earth to do right. And we don't understand the depth of his holiness. And we don't understand the depth of our own sin. And hence the righteous nature of his um, wrath against us. But notice something. To have mercy. Eleos. Eleos. Mercy and compassion. Those are free actions of God. Those are free actions of God. They cannot be forced out of him. They, that's, those are aspects of grace. Grace cannot be demanded. And yet many, many people that I encounter think that they can demand God to be gracious. There is, we in, we in America, I'll be honest, one of the things we miss that is a part of the text is the necessary reverence for kingship. We don't have that. We have no kings. And so there is, a, there is a level of demand that mankind can express toward God that's never to be found in inspired scripture, ever. It's scary. We think we can. Here, Han An, Han An, whoever. Whoever I mercy, whoever I have compassion on. Who's, who's making the decisions here? God is. That's why Romans 9 is so unsettling to people. Until you find some filter to, to run it through, to, to, to wash all that stuff out. But we're not doing that. We're just letting the text say, the text says. Therefore, Therefore, because of what's here, therefore, it is u to thelontos. Thelontos, fellow, I wish, I desire. It is, does not depend on the man who wills, wishes, desires it isn't it isn't i thought this whole thing was establishing justification by faith no it's not it's establishing god's freedom to order his decrees and his way of salvation and his way of establishing covenants and dealing with man this is the foundation of paul's answer why is it that they're not all israel who are from israel right this is the, got, got to keep the thing flowing. It is not of the one willing. Neither is it of the one literally running. Running, engaging in activity, doing things. It's not the one who makes decisions. It's not the one who is active in trying to do things. But, adversative use of Allah, but the mercying God. Oops. All of man's vaunted free will, autonomy, true subjunctive conditionals, fly out the window. Fly out the window. Belontes, man. Trekontos, man. Eleontos, God. Isn't that what it says? Am I missing something? Am I mistranslating something? No. 
Therefore, it is not of the one willing, nor the one running, but the mercying God. Offensive? Maybe to some. So do you want an example of this? All right, we'll get an example of this. And we'll get the example uh, from Israel's own history. For the scripture says to Pharaoh that Eis Alta Tuta, for this unto this, for this very purpose, I raised you up. Pharaoh, there's a purpose. For this very purpose I raised you up. To do what? To demonstrate. To demonstrate in you, Pharaoh. In you. My dunamin. My power. That's, wow. Really? But what about Pharaoh's free will and what about God being a gentleman and, you know, all that stuff that we hear all the time? I mean, let's be honest. I know all sorts of people who will simply say, I will never worship a God who is concerned about the demonstration of his own power. I've talked to them. The vast, I, I can't, I can't. Quote unquote progressive Christians who are not Christians at all can't even begin to enter into this. No, I no no. How I you raised up Pharaoh to demonstrate your power in him, and that your name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And you go into the Old Testament story and. Wow, Israel's going to the land and people in the land are going, we, we heard about what happened down there in Egypt. We heard about what happened to the gods of Egypt. You see, God kept hardening Pharaoh's heart because all the gods of Egypt had not yet been demonstrated to have been false gods. I saw a chart just recently of at least someone's estimation of which god was being demonstrated to be a false god in each one of the plagues. Because man, if... Just simply on an economic basis. Pharaoh, after the first plague, should have said, you're out of here. Right? God had to harden his heart because he wanted his name proclaimed throughout all the earth. And the question I have for most people is, is does that really matter? Does that really matter? Oh my goodness, I've run out of time. Oh. And I do have to run through this quickly. Sorry, but I have someone in the other room actually waiting to do another interview, so I have to, I have to go quickly here. I didn't want to, but I started preaching. So quickly. So then, whom he wills, not whom uh, allows him to, Makes it possible to him. Whom he wills, he mercies. And whom he wills, sclerunai. To harden. To harden. That's exactly what Paul was talking about, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Whom he wishes, he mercies. Whom he wishes, he hardens. You will say therefore to me, why does he still, why does he yet memphatai? Why does he still find fault? For who can stand against his will? Here's where man says, if that's the case, then God cannot judge. If you are saying that, you are the opponent to Paul. You are the opponent to the apostle. You need to understand that. Many of you say this over and over again. Every one of you goes, well, you have to, doesn't matter what you say, you know, uh, God just uh, has, has uh, 
determined that I'm not supposed to believe that. I really worry about anyone who makes that argument. I really do. You've not thought through this through at all. Who can stand against his will? Oh, man. Who are you? Who, an- who are you? The one answering back to God. Who are you? The one answering back to God. Will ta plasma. This isn't from Star Trek. Okay. Say to the plasanti, why did you make me like this? Will the thing molded, formed, say to the molder, why did you make me like this? There is an ontological element. Some people say, Paul did not answer here. Oh, you better believe he answered, and he answered fully. As long as you understand that you are a creature formed by God. He has the right to do with you as he pleases. And then, the key issue, and I'm going to have to... Should have watched... You know what? We need a clock. We need a clock in here in the back wall. Because it's trying to find that little doodly doodly there is too small. We need, a, we need let's get a digital clock so that I have uh All right. Quickly. Does not the potter the one who uh creates these things the the former of of the uh of the clay from the same lump, the right to make a timane skewos or atamion. So timane, honorable or dishonorable. So doesn't the potter have the right to take a piece of clay and make a skewos timane or a skewos atamion? And the Expected answer using ook in the Greek language is, yeah, duh, of course he does. This then becomes the potter then, and here's the the main problem with Flame's attempt. This question is connected right there, back here. He broke that connection. He broke that connection. What if God, willing to make known his wrath, I'm sorry, to demonstrate his wrath, and to make known his power, so there's, there's the two things that, again, I simply have to ask everybody, honestly, where does that fit in your understanding of God? Because there are many of you who do not believe that it is important for God to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known. You just don't believe it. Because you've, you've embraced religiosity, but not a biblical faith. Scripture says this is important to God. If it's not important to you, got a problem. So make his power known. Endured with much makathumia, much patience, Skue orges, vessels of wrath, prepared unto destruction. Now, Lenski and others say, ah, but see, the form here of katartidzo doesn't tell you it was formed by God necessarily. And down here, the ones prepared for glory that's more clearly because this is this is a verb and God's the but this is a participle. So, so the idea being, well, see, that's that's where the door has been opened. They've prepared themselves. There's one problem with that. This connects this to this. You've still got the same potter. You still got the skewe here and the skewe up here. There isn't some chasm that exists. Between verses 21 and 22. It's the apostolic interpretation. 
I know why people want to do it. But if you're honestly asking yourself, what is it that Paul is communicating? Then you've got to recognize these things. And so he endures much patience. Those, those, those vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. In order that he might make known under the vessels of the, the riches of his mercy to the skue eleus. And remember, there's mercy. Take that back up to where we, before, we were before. I mercy whom I mercy. It's all God's freedom all the way through. Because then it says in verse 24, and who are these vessels of mercy? We who have been what? Kaleo called. There's your election. Not only from the Jews, but from among the Gentiles. There's your election. Now, if I had more time, I'd jump down here and I had intended to go down into the rest of the application here, the Old Testament text, because Paul will use the term lima, the remnant. It's so consistent. It's, you can what here, last thing I'll say, John 6, the reason you all fail is because you can't walk through the text. Romans 9, the reason you all fail is because you can't walk through the text. You can't start at the beginning and just follow the terms, follow the grammar, follow the reasoning. And there are some people think that's, well, that's not overly difficult to do. Yeah, well then do it. I realize that it, it, it sounds so much better to, well, I'm going to go over here and get this, and I'm going to go over here. Walk through the text first. Then you can do all the background stuff you want, but you've got to walk through the text first. When you do that, the thread that we looked at simply does not accurately represent what Romans 9 is actually saying. So all due respect to you, Flame, but I hope that you will think about that and uh, consider that. And if there's responses to be offered, make them responses that flow from the text. Not, well, but what if we looked at it this way? Or what? No, flow with the text. Let it fit what the apostle is doing. Otherwise, you're just making excuses.